Welcome to the Yibaneh Beit Midrash. Welcome home to Torah. Um, I want to welcome the people that are online on Skype. And they're really privileged because they get to uh, receive the sheets in advance. The Hebrew sheets that we're using from uh, the Kliakar. And as a live audience, they also receive from me an English, an English source sheet. However, I want to mention for those who are watching online, these sheets, the Hebrew sheets, are accessible. I'll tell you how. If you go to yibanet.com, and then there's a browser, that's our website, and you go to the yibanet.com website, under the browser it says chesed or learning um, op opportunities. So you click there, or you put your uh, cursor over it, and then it brings it down, it says midrasha, midrashia, or the um, Beit Midrash Erev. When you click on that or put your uh, cursor there, then it would bring down a weekly Klee Karshir with Rabbi Postin. And then another uh, browser, another thing will pop down, which will give you which book to choose from. You know, from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy. And then you have to know, you have to check it out, you have to know which book you're going to look for. And once you get to the page, so the whole, let's say the whole book of Leviticus is there, and then you'll go to Achremos. And you'll be able to, um, hopefully, you can even print it out. Or you can watch, uh, while you're watching the video, you could, um, you know, split screen or minimize, whatever it is. Um, but uh, they're available. And one of the ideas, besides the depth of learning, of just hearing, I would like, and I appreciate when my students, when the people partic participate, put their finger on the spot, and they're actually learning Hebrew at the same time. It's a great way to learn Hebrew. No, it's not modern uh, speaking Hebrew, it's, it's ancient Hebrew, but it doesn't matter because that's where the modern uh, t tongue, that's where the modern language comes from and it'll help you in your prayers, it'll help you in your, your studies of the Bible, of the Tanakh. It's, a, it's just a great resource that I hope that you take advantage of it because I'm sitting here translating it, not just speaking in English. I think it's a very important tool, uh, I know it is, and that is to learn Hebrew, to know Hebrew. So if we go to chapter 16 in Leviticus, it's, um, it's in the very beginning, verses 1 and 2. Oh, I just want to mention, we are dealing with the Kliakar, by the way. So it's a great, it's an unbelievable perush, an unbelievable uh, commentary that he is such an expert in diktuk, in, in grammar and, and understanding the Hebrew language, where he's able to draw out many things that we already know. We already know them from reading the Gemaras, from reading the Midrashim, from reading Rashi, right? From reading parts of the Oral Torah that explain the written Torah. He brings it out and makes it so real because if we would, first of all, if we would just read the written text alone, there's no way, no way that anybody would ever understand. And I mean even uh, a learned Jew. You have to have the Oral Torah that accompanies the written Torah. And I'm going to speak about this in the beginning of my Saturday night shear. And by the way, it's not on Yibane, it's on Noahide World Center. Noahide World Center um, fa uh, Facebook page as well as YouTube. And I'm going to discuss a little bit more about the Oral Torah then. But in the meantime, let's get started. So when the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of Aaron's two sons, Yidabi Hashem El Moshe Achre Mos. Shnei b'nei Aaron. And now this is highlighted. When they drew near before the Lord and they died. Bikravatam lifnei Hashem v'yamutu. That's the first verse. And then the Lord said to Moses, Speak to your brother Aaron. V'yomer Hashem el Moshe daber el Aaron achicha. Speak to your brother. Al yavo b'kol es. Do not, he should not come at all times. Okay, this is going to be fantastic. When we get into this, what does it mean he shouldn't come at any time? He shouldn't come at all times? Or he shouldn't come whenever there is a time? Okay, I, in other words, in order to understand this, we, you have to stick with us for the next hour. But it, all we saw is the English. He should not come at all times. What does that mean? Look at the Hebrew. Val Yavo, he shouldn't come. <coughs> Bekol eight. 
What does that mean? How would you translate that? We'll have to see. Into the holy within the dividing curtain. El Kodesh mi Beit leparoches. And into the holy in front of the cover that is upon the ark. El Peneha Kapores, Asher al Aron. So that he should not die. The Lo Yamut. Why? For I appear over the ark, cover in a cloud. Kibanan Eroa Eroe Al Hakaparis. Okay, fine, very nice. Let's go directly into the words of the Kliakar. He begins to like get our minds thinking. Like, I always use this as an example. The old, uh, the old motorcycles, I, I, or, you know, when I was a kid anyway, we had motorcycles that you had to pull a string to start the engine. Right? Today, I think it's all, uh, I think it's all um, electric uh, ignition. But uh, let's say a lawnmower, maybe, that, maybe today it's also electric, electric ignition. But there used to be a, a way to start a motor. Maybe even, uh, what do they call those things? Uh, uh, generators. I have no idea today if any of these things work with a drawstring. But uh, anyway, so I think like when you, um, where was I going with this? He, it's like pulling the drawstring to get, this, to get our brains start thinking. He asked the most, I think, deepest questions that you and I, are, I'm saying for me, I never would have thought about. Okay, maybe you would have. Re ready for the first question? The kasha. The difficulty is, im kain, dibor rishon lehechen azal. Where does that first verse take us? The first verse ends where it says, and they died. The, right, the first uh, verse. And the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of Aaron's two sons, when they drew near before the Lord and they died. He's going to tell us there's no command here. And there's no new information either. Why? Why is there no in new information? First, you have to be clear. There's no command? Okay, there's no command. What about new information? That's why I brought down, if you look at Leviticus 10, verses uh, 1 through 3, you can see right away, we're talking about five, six chapters earlier, and Aaron's sons, Nadav and Avihu, each took his pan, right, and put fire in them, they placed incense upon it, and they brought, they brought before the Lord foreign fire, which he had not commanded them. A fire went forth from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses uh, said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke when he said, okay, this is important, but the point we just read was, and they died. So who died? Nada, Vavihu, the two sons, two of the four, two sons of, Na, uh, two sons of Aaron. So we already know this. Now what day, by the way, what day is this all taking place? So on my Monday night shear, I asked, and very uh, promptly, uh, the answer was given wrongly. <laughs> well, it was a guess, I assume. And uh, someone said it must be Yom Kippur, because right away we see all the laws of Yom Kippur. <coughs> no. So first of all, if you want to go back even further into Exodus, um, they go to Exodus chapter 24, it's really verse 11, but you can get it from the whole context of the verses before. And the nobles, this is number 4 on the source sheet, four, number 4 on page 4. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand, and they perceived God, they ate and drank. Okay, so one second, I'm confusing everybody. I asked what day this actually happened on. The day that this took place was Yom HaShemini in Parshat Shemini, which we just read in par, uh, the ch 10th chapter. Fine. So in other words, in uh, Leviticus chapter 10 is where they died, and that's in Parshat Shemini. But when were they supposed to die? That's the, really the question. So apparently, if you go to Exodus chapter 24, verse 11, <coughs> this is during the revelation of Mount Sinai. At the great and awesome day of the Sinaitic experience, it says that he did not lay his hand, Hashem withheld from punishment. That's what it means. He did not lay his hand while they perceived God and they ate and drank. Look at Rashi. What does it mean upon the nobles? They being Nadav and Avihu and the elders, because that's who was told to come to this um, experience. To, right? You had Moshe, you had Aaron, you had um, the other Kohanim, you had the elders, you had Nadav and Avihu. 
It says he did not lay his hand. This indicates they deserved that a hand be laid upon them, meaning punishment. They did something, something in this experience, in chapter 24, verse 11, when they were experiencing the most incredible revolution, revelation, they were doing something that seemed to be inappropriate. They ate and drank. Look at the next Rashi, and they perceived God. They gazed at him with levity. Now in Hebrew, it's belayed gas. I don't think levity is the best translation, but we'll leave it. They, let's, they did something inappropriate. They didn't have kavod rosh. Kavod rosh means um, a seriousness, a sobriety, right? They were drinking and eating during this moment. <clears throat> let's look again, Rashi. They gazed at him with levity while they were eating and drinking. So at least this is the interpretation of the Medrash Tan Chuma. Fine. Okay, so let's go back. Now we understand. Let's go through this uh, time frame. We're talking about the actual death in Achre Mos is something that took place six chapters earlier on Yom Hashmini, on the eighth day of the inauguration of the tabernacle. Okay, clear as mud. What day was that? It was the first day of Nisan. Remember the first day of Nisan? That was after seven days of, uh, of, of, of Moshe putting together, erecting the tabernacle, taking it apart. Then the eighth day was the first of Nisan, and then the princes brought for the following 12 days gifts for the Mizbech, for the altar. So that happened almost a full year after we left Egypt, because we're talking about, we left on the 15th of Nisan, we're talking about the first of Nisan, so we're talking about what? 11 and a half months later. But when did the, so we're talking about 50 days after we left is when we had the revelation. So you're talking about like a year short of 50 days, or 60 days, almost two months. Uh, so let's say, how many years, how many months are there in a year? 12, right? So you're talking about almost 10 months uh, after we left. That uh, uh, um, Nadav and Avihu are killed, are put to death, sanctified. We don't even know yet what, where this is leading because there's going to be two sides. Were they guilty of something, as we just seem to imply in the Rashi? Or is there more to the story than meets the eye? Well, you already know the answer. There's going to be more to the story than meets the eye. Okay, so the very first line of the clear car says, where is the first verse, where is the first statement going? Lo niskar bo shum velo shum devarim. It doesn't have a command, and it doesn't relay any new information. We got that across. There is no command, and there's no information. No new information. And now look at Rashi. This is on page one. So this Rashi is very interesting, because it's going to give us some insight into what's actually going on behind the scenes. What does this teach us when it specifies Achremos, after the death of Aaron's two sons? So Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah illustrates the answer with a parable. A parable, a mashal, okay, about a physician. Now it's one sick person and two doctors. So this is how the story goes. The first doctor enters and he tells the patient, it's the same patient, don't eat cold food, don't lay in, in, a, dry, in a wet, damp place, a, a cold place. And that's pretty much the only advice he gives him. The second physician now enters and says exactly the same words. Don't eat cold food and don't lie in a damp, uh, cold place. But he adds one more line. So that you will not die the way so-and-so died. So what's the difference between doctor number one and doctor number two? It seems that doctor number two would be more effective in getting the message across, because he really gave it to him over the head, right? He, he, uh, he laid it on the line for him. You don't want to die. So this one warned the patient more effectively than the former. That's why Rashi's telling us that the scripture says right after the death of Aaron, uh, I'm sorry, the death of Aaron's two sons, a whole prescription of what to do or not to do on Yom Kippur. Again, we're going to ask the question, what does Yom Kippur <laughs> actually have to do with, with what? With the Shavuos, with 
the, the day of the revelation. All right. Remind me. Can someone remind me? That's a very important question. It's not in the clear car. What is the, is the common denominator? Okay? I, mean, I, I think it's very important for this lesson. But that's not where he's going at right now. Okay. So, so far, we just read the third line. Masha Perish Rashi, as Rashi explains, Masha Lechoyla. This is an analogous to the sick person. Now, right away, the Kleikar says, Eno mit Yashev. He doesn't feel this is a sufficient answer to resolve whatever was bothering him. Because, why? Ki pasok rishon lo nizkar shum tzivoy. Why bring in this mashal, why bring in the analogy of this doctor that gives a little bit more of an explanation when the Pusik itself, the verse verse, doesn't give any judgment, doesn't give any command at all. It doesn't really justify bringing this mashal to explain why there's no uh, command. Venochal Amar, so he actually says, we're actually able to say that the last four words of the first verse, and in, in English it's not four words, but I highlight it, when they drew near before the Lord, they died. So in Hebrew it is, Bikravatam lifne Hashem viamutu. Those four words. In their coming close to Hashem, they died. That's, that's it. That's going to be the answer. Strange. Eina Maimar Katuvlanu. The clear card says this verse, the first verse, is not really speaking to us, but rather, Kadesh Baruch Hu Mediber El Moshe Arba Milos Elu. But the God is, that's the words that God is conveying and speaking to Moses. Zen Nosach Dibor Rishon. And now this is the, I guess, the version or the explanation of what that first statement was. Ready? Ki Hashem Lahodia Lamosha. That what did God want to convey to Moshe? He wanted to convey something to him. Not that the two sons died, because that was already known. But the reason that they died. Clear as mud? The reason. From which aspect of sin, what mistake that they made, that the two children of Aaron died? This is a very important comment that I'm about to make, because you've heard me say it before. You'll find this in page 3, number 3. The difference between the word Dibur and the word Amira, Al Omer. Okay, and if you translate both those words, it sounds the same in English. To speak, to say, to tell over. But no, they're two different words. The most used verse in all of Torah is the Yedaber Adonoi El Moshe Lemur. God spoke to Moses saying. So the word Dibur speaking is like harsh, it's in concrete, it's unmovable, it, we're going to see, he says it's Midas Hadin, in the name of the Vilna Gon. Okay, we'll, we'll see it shortly. It's related to what we call the written Torah. This is God's word. But God says to Moses to say over. In other words, God spoke to Moses, what does the word saying mean? It doesn't make any sense. God spoke to Moses, whatever he said, I want you to tell over, to say. God spoke to Moses to say. So that's where the word Amira comes in. Amira is a soft language. That the, the writ, the Torah Shebech Tav, what we call the scripture, that is, you cannot change it. It is hard letters that are, that's it, right? They're concrete. You don't change the letters, right? And the, the, the Amira is what we call the Oral Torah. That is where every generation must adapt the language and the understanding so that the next generation can actually understand and hear what is being said. But that's not my point. The point, let's read, in the name of the Vilna Gon, the first, he brings down, like, for example, uh, in Hazinu, He's just going, going through the difference between the Yomer and the, the Yadaber in Hazinu, which is Deuteronomy chapter 32, 1. Listen, O heavens, Hazinu HaShemayim Beira, and I will speak. So the word Dibur is used. And that's God 
talking from heaven, so to speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth, v'tishma ha'aretz imre fi. There's a imre, there's a, a, a soft language over there, and that has to do with spe- like actual um, conveying a message to the mouth. Okay, look in, um, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 3. So in this verse, Moses ascends to God, Moshe Olo El Elohim, the Yikra Olav, and God calls out to him, Minahar, from the mountain, Lamor, saying, Kosomar Leves Yaakov. This is what you're supposed to say to base Yaakov, but the word Omer, Tomar, is used. Okay? This is what you should, how you should speak to base Yaakov. And base Yaakov is a, um, a code word for the women. Okay? The Tagid Livne Israel. But speak, and I'll use the word harshly because. The word tagid is like the word from gid hanasha. It's a it's a sinew. It's not a vein. It's not necessarily a soft vein, but it's a hard tissue. Okay, so the word tagid is related to gid gid hanasha. It's something that's hard. And look at the uh, Rashi on that. To the house of Yet Jacob, these are the women. Speak to them in a gentle language. But when it says to tell tagid livnei Israel, speak to the sons of Israel. Speak to them harsher. Tell them about the punishments and their details. Make things, things that are harsh as wormwood. Okay? So that is a different type of a language. Um, so uh, I'll go, go back into the um, number three, the difference. So the Vilna Gon explains, like we just saw in Hazinu, that the word Dibur is linked to Torah Shebechtav. It's related to the written Torah. And Vyomer is related or linked to Torah Shabbat Peh, is linked to the, the oral Torah. Okay. Let's go back into the Kliakar and finish this paragraph off. He begins by telling us, al kein his kibbo dibor kasheh. That's why the first statement was harsh. Ki hadin. That is telling us in a strict judgmental fashion. And only afterwards, in Nimshach, Mahodazu, only the rest of the few verses are going to now explain to Aaron what he should do to prevent, right, preventative medicine. Pre- the first statement was about the death of the sons of Aaron, which is harsh. But the second and, and so forth, the verses are, Lahazir es Aaron, shlo ye nichvad begachalatan. It was a warning to Aaron that he should not become burnt through coals. Nichve begachaltan. That's why it says the Yomer, and that is a Emira Raka. Raka is soft language. Okay, so we're going to continue. Ubiur ha'inyan. The clarification of this matter is as follows. Shebene Aaron, hayu ruyin lishlichut yad. That really in truth, the two sons of Aaron were fitting to have been punished. When it says lishlichut yad, to have the hand sent against them, because of what we mentioned earlier in Exodus chapter twenty-four, verse eleven, right where it says he did not lay his hand, they perceived God or they had a vision of God, yet they continued to eat, eat and drink. V'yachazu es elokim v'yoklu v'yishtu. So what's the problem? I mean, we saw it in Rashi, but he'll 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 dish it out. She's tachlu b'shchina that they glanced, that they looked at the divine presence. Mitoch leiv gas. Now that's not easy to translate because we saw in Rashi he says levity. I I don't know. Listen, it's not a sober, serious attitude. That's for sure. So therefore, levity would fit. But lev gas literally means a coarse heart, or a coarse spirit. So I would think more like a arrogance, some type of a haughtiness, to continue to eat and drink while Hashem is giving His total dedication and presence to you. Okay. So, But I'll just stick to the words, lev gas shel michael mishta, within the eating and drinking, they had this thing called Leiv Gas. The, but guess what Hashem did? Him tim lehem baruchu. Hashem waited. Hashem waited for them. 
כדי שלא לארבב שמחת התורה. In order to not mix in, he doesn't say what he's mixing in, but we're, God forbid, mixing in grieving, grieving or mourning with the revelation of receiving the Torah. This was, as we say, it's Pentecost. It's the 50th day after leaving Egypt and when the receiving of the Torah. <clears throat> okay, so in order to not dampen the mood, bring down the spirit, right? So did I bring anything down here? Um, I got a lot of pages here, so I don't want to get too mixed up. Not yet. Okay, so we'll continue. Um, I thought that was a very important piece. Uh, Ra yeah, there is a Rashi um, on verse 10 that I wanted to look at. Let's see. Rashi. have to find it. I would assume it's at the Oh, it's on page two. Okay. Look at Rashi. It's on page two. A fire went forth. <clears throat> so there's, this Rashi brings down different reasons or maybe different possibilities of sin on what they did wrong, that uh, they were killed. Rabbi Yezer says Aaron's so sons died only because they rendered halachic decisions in the presence of Moses, their teacher. By the way, you should know, this is one of um, one of the 613 commandments, I believe. You're not allowed to do this. Rabbi Yishmael says they died because they had entered the sanctuary after having drunk wine. So we'll see through the Achremos, through our Parsha, what should not happen. Anytime that a Kohen drinks a certain amount, he cannot do service in the temple. Okay, the proof is after their death, the scripture then goes and admonishes the survivors, which would be Aaron's surviving sons and, and the Kohanim, that they may not enter the sanctuary after having drunk wine. <clears throat> Where do I want to go with this? Um, well, I'll tell you the truth. This is a beautiful Rashi, and we should really go through the whole thing because we're going to discuss it anyway, so we might as well do it now. This is analogous to a king that had a faithful attendant. When he found him standing at the tavern entrances, meaning he was going to go get drunk, <coughs> he severed his head in silence and appointed another attendant in his place. We would not know why he was first put to death, but after his in enjoining, but for his enjoining the second thus, so he tells this the replacement, right? You must not enter the doorway of taverns. From that we know that such a person he had put first to death. The reason why was because he was drunk. So this is, a, in other words, it's actually a piece of Gomorrah that goes through many different reasons. Uh, so this Rashi only brings a few. Um, we talk about the, the uh, Aish Zara, right? It talks about a strange fire. Um, let's talk about this other thing. Then it says, a fire went forth before, before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. But we would not know why they, not any of the who died, before, but for his commanding Aaron, do not drink wine that will lead to intoxication. So that's one idea. Like I mentioned about um, strange fire, because the, the, the verse literally says that they brought in this strange fire, and they shouldn't do such a thing. So it could be, from an alcoholic's point of view, right, that drinking is like in do, in bringing in a strange fire. Okay, for those who enjoy a strong drink now and then, you understand what I mean. I think they even called it in Indian, in Indian terms, uh, and it was must a fire drink, you know, and they got the, they got the, 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 the whiskey from the, uh, the white men. They probably called it something like that. Um, but in, even in, in Hebrew, in the original language, right, it's, it's um, I forget the exact terminology, but it's srefa, shtia srefa. It's a burning drink. Right? We're not talking about wine, but we're talking about stronger alcohol. Anyway, so go on. We know that they had died precisely on account of the wine. For this reason, Scripture showed love to Aaron by directing the divine, divine utterance to him by saying, do not drink wine, which will lead to this intoxication. Okay. Um, this part of the Rashi we're going to deal with later. Okay, so I want to skip it for now. 
All right, let's go back into the text of the Kliyakar. Now, the last thing we said was in order not to mix the death of Aaron's two sons with the receiving of the Torah, that would dampen the mood. Kiesh, I'm sorry, ukeneged zeb, bolt sivoy zel Aaron. And it's because of this, on account of this, that the command was told over to Aaron that he shouldn't go in what? Listen to this. Shalo yavo el kodesh. He shouldn't go in, he shouldn't enter. The kol yom, on any day. Shiesh bo achila v'shtiyah. On any day where there is eating and drinking. Now, for those in the audience, they know what day is what day in the Jewish year is the day where there is no eating or drinking. Very simple. It is Yom Kippur. So, what was the, what were they doing originally at Simchat Torah? At sorry, not Simcha, at the revelation of the Torah, which was great Simcha. They were eating and drinking, and over here. This is the day they're supposed to go into the temple. They shouldn't eat or drink. So I'm going to make it clear they shouldn't eat or drink. Uh, it's only on a day that they don't eat or drink. Now, I mentioned earlier that there's going to be a connection. I might as well mention it now. Out of the entire calendar, right, you have holidays. And they basically explain what those holidays are about. Or let's say even for sure what we're really talking about is not just an explanation. So you have an explanation and you have a date, right? You have the leaving of Egypt, so we know the date, it's clearly defined, it's the 15th of Nisan, and we know it's because we left Egypt. It's called Haga Matzot, right? Fine. You have um, Yom Kippur, it's clearly, there's a date, it's the 10th of the month, and it's called the Day of Atonement, okay? You have Sukkot, you have Shemini Yetzirah. So what is it? Rosh Hashanah, we all know, is the day of the blowing of the shofar, and that's how it's described, okay? But it doesn't say it's the day of judgment. It does not say that. It doesn't use the word days of judgment. So you wouldn't know it's actually the day of judgment because it doesn't say it. What about the Torah? Actually, it's 50 days after leaving Egypt. So we received the Torah. But it doesn't say the date. So there's a date that's missing. Okay? And even Shavuos, when it's mentioned in the Torah, it doesn't say celebrate, celebrate Shavuos because it is the day you receive the Torah. It just says it's the day they bring the first fruits. Right, or it's the culmination of the seven weeks and it's related to agriculture, but there's no demarcation mark in the calendar that this is the day of receiving the Torah. So what I'm trying to say is that there's a connection between these two dates. That would be Shavuos, the day of receiving the Torah, which is not mentioned. Specifically, it's the day of receiving the Torah, meaning the date the 6th of Sivan. And Rosh Hashanah, there's a date, but it doesn't mention that it's the day of judgment. Okay? So what is it about these two days? These both are days of judgment. And I've talked about this before, that if the Torah would have said that the first day of Tishrei is the day of judgment, then people would feel that the other 364 days of the year are not a day of judgment. It's only this day. So I really don't have to worry about um, my actions or my thoughts or how I speak until maybe a few days before, maybe a week before, or that day alone, right? So the Torah specifically does not mention that it's the Day of Judgment, so that one should not feel all the other days that he doesn't have to worry about judgment, because he should. He should. He, she should. Okay? And what about the receiving of the Torah? That actually God wants us to feel, and He allows us to receive the Torah on a daily basis. So don't think, oh, we only receive the Torah once a year, or at that one point in time. Really, every single day, right? We should feel that the Torah is new to us every single day. So the combination of these two ideas, we should always feel that we could be judged at any moment, and we are being judged at any moment, and that we should be receiving the Torah at any moment. Okay, so there's a great connection. The Kliyakar here brings a different idea, and we're going to get into it soon. But so far, what we do know is that the day of Shavuos is the day that Nadav and Avihu committed this seemingly horrible uh, mistake and it's even though they didn't die on that day and they died on the first of Nisan it's all about the warnings that have to do with Yom Kippur okay back into the text so 
that he shouldn't, this is the warning to Aaron, this is the command to Aaron, that he shouldn't come into the Holy of Holies, he shouldn't go into the Kodesh, the Kol Yom, any day where there's eating or drinking, Ki Im Biyom Kippur, except on the Day of Atonement, Ki av, um, Yom Avono, uh, sorry, Yom Anot Adam Nafsho, because it's the day that a person afflicts his soul. What is it that affects us when we don't eat or drink? Okay, there's five prohibitions altogether, right? Besides eating and drinking, what else? We don't wear leather, we don't wash, we don't cohabitate, okay? But we don't, and we don't eat, and we don't drink, okay? We don't anoint oils. So, what is it? Um, it's when you, I guess, we're talking about an, afflicting your soul. By not eating and drinking, you feel humbled. But we're going to see another aspect. Not only are you humbled on one hand, but this way you actually can re reach the highest levels like the administering angels that do not need to eat or drink. Okay? So it's very interesting in Judaism. There's so many... I don't, I, I'm not that highly educated to come up with these fancy words that people won't understand. But it's not an oxymoron. There's so many things that are counterintuitive, right? That's, that are actually contradictory in itself. You're talking about Yom Kippur, you're, you're afflicting your soul, you're doing it, you're physically refraining from doing things to make yourself feel wholesome on that le on that's in the physical way. But it's going to then affect your soul on a, such a deep level level where you feel the humility, where you feel that there's no distractions of the physicality and that you're actually able to then reach the highest levels, the holiest day of the year. It's amazing. Okay, so, so far we're, we're mentioning here that it's only in Yom Kippur, the day that you afflict your soul. Ki az hu bo The word hachna'a means submiss be submissive. It's then, on that day, that the person would come, on the, that day, to a, I call it a healthy or a proper submissive attitude before his Creator. This is why God prefaced, he advises, he gives this counsel to Moshe as an introduction. By mentioning the reason. Remember, the, the idea that they died is nothing new. That we already know ten, uh, six chapters before, in chapter 10. But why they died, that we didn't know. So he wanted to mention to him first the reason they died. In order that the second statement the command of don't go in at just any times into the holies will have a much more bigger impact. That this is the version, this is the text that God spoke to Moshe after the death of the Shnei Bnei Aron, after the death of the two sons of Aaron. And what did he say? He only said those four words. In, they're coming close before Hashem, and they died. Bikaravatam lifnei Hashem v'yamutu. Hodiu, in order to inform him what? Shalachach mesu, this is why they died. Lefish nitkarvu el Hashem. Now this is, mind ba, because they came close to God. Isn't that what we all want? Isn't that what we're all missing in our lives? We all want to come close to Hashem. We all want to have an intimate communal communion with Hashem? Don't we all want to come close to Hashem? But it was low bezmana roy. It was not at the correct time. We all have to find the right place and the right time. Bezrat Hashem. It should be soon. And it should be done properly. So, if it's not done properly, it's a mistake. Lefish and kravu el Hashem shalom bezmana roy. They didn't go into the deepest of deeps of the Holy of Holies at the right time. As it says, we saw already in, as we mentioned in um, chapter 10, verse 2 and 3, where they gazed at Hashem. Oh no, this was in right in Exodus. I'm sorry. It was in Exodus, uh, chapter 24. Okay. Uh, where they gazed at Hashem. 
fine. Okay, so the next paragraph I found a little difficult, and I just want to try to sum it up to mention that what he does is he asks an, he asks a question: it, Why is the verse um, in third person? In other words, we mentioned that the verse says, "Find it." When they drew before the Lord, why didn't it just say when they drew before me, or they came close to me? So basically, what he does in typical Cleokar style is show that it's not unusual. You have a few examples. I'm not going to go into them, and um, where Hashem is the narrator and he speaks of himself in third person, and also the word Vayamutu should have, according to grammar, done without the vav and the yud. Because what does a yud do before the verb? It's future, a future. Okay? And the vav is called a vav afuch, it turns it into past. So would you need to give me a prefix of a future in order to just add another prefix of a, something that turns it into past? Uh, we're not going to go into that now, but basically um, he, he, he goes through this little grammatical issue. And I want to go to the next paragraph because I don't want to get bogged down. I'm sure it's important, but we're going to skip, skip it for now. Gam yitachin lafaresh. Now we're in the next paragraph. It's, now it's, it's possible to explain as follows. Bikarabatam lifne Hashem. When it says to come, right, and they're coming close before Hashem. Why? Because they were extremely close to Hashem. This is very like mind-boggling. This is the opposite of what we thought all along. That they sinned. That they did something wrong. They might have done something wrong, but we're going to see what happens. Ready for this statement? Wow. That the higher level you are, the closer you are to God, the more you're judged. The closer you are, God is more worried or concerned about the details. Even the smallest, slightest infraction will incur a penalty. This is what the words say. Al came diktek kadosh baruch mehem ledunam. And an example, now I don't think this is a, a, the only example. This you can find in Psalms chapter 50 verse 3. Now I think I brought a few other examples because I felt that, let's see. You'll find this on page 5. Yeah. And it's, I mentioned, it's chapter 50 in Psalms. Our God shall come and not be silent. Fire shall devour before Him. And around Him it storms furiously. So it's, we, listen, there's no, God is the, is the place, but He's no place, okay? But using the terminology of the Torah and the Tanakh, that those that are closest to Hashem, the fire shall devour before Him, those who are close to Him, and all around him there is this fire. He shall call the heavens above and to the earth to avenge his people. So in Hebrews, but the Rashi mentions, what does it mean our God shall come and not be silent any longer concerning the, split, the, split, the spilt blood of his servants? Okay, so the next verse I think is a better example, which is actually what we said before, it's just a continuation we didn't read. When we mentioned that they were, um, it's in Leviticus chapter 10. <coughs> the fire went forth from before the Lord and consumed Avi, uh, um, Nadav and Aviyu, and they died before the Lord. Then it says, then Moses said to Aram, this is what God is saying. Okay, ready? This is the message. I will be sanctified though through those who are near me. And me we're talking about those who are really close to Hashem. They're close to God. And God will be glorified or sanctified through them. I will be sanctified through those. Look at Rashi. Now we actually did this. 
But we didn't do the latter part, did we? Look at the, in other words, on page 6 near the end, and all the people, and before all the people I will be glorified. Uh, the one before that. Those who are near me. Who are those who are near me? My chosen ones. And before all the people I will be glorified, when the Holy One, blessed be He, exacts judgment upon the righteous, He becomes feared, exalted, and praised. Now wouldn't you think when God exalt, um, um, exacts judgment against the evil people, so I want to mention this is well let's let's continue. So how much more so is it concerning the wicked? In other words, for sure the wicked, but even the righteous. And this is where it comes in. There's a verse in Psalm 68:36. You are awesome, O God, from your sanctuaries. Now don't read it Mimikdashai, Mikdashi. Don't read it as my sanctuaries, but read it as a Mimikdashai from your sanctuaries. Not from your sanctuaries, but from your sanctified ones. From your sanctified ones. From God's sanctified ones. He becomes glorified. Now, I want to stop here a second because when this corona first hit, I shouldn't say first hit, but when it, when it, in the early stages, before Pesach, a lot of Rabbanim, a lot of uh, very chashuv, uh, very important uh, Jewish leaders were taken out by this virus. And um, I don't know if people's Amuna faith was rocked. I don't know. But I mentioned this before. There's a verse. There's a verse in the Torah, in Mishpatim, that I can open it up in a second, that speaks about when a fire goes forth. When the fire goes forth and destroys what? And destroys, let's just say, it first affects, right? If it's it's um, caught onto the thorns, but it burns and consumes the grains. Okay, so what is that all about? Let me just open up the verse real quick. Yes, yeah, so it's in uh, Mishpatim, uh, chapter 22 of Exodus, verse 6. I'll first read in English. Uh, verse 5. If a fire shall go forth and find thorns, and a stack of grain, or a standing crop, or a field is consumed. The one who kindled the fire shall make restitution. <coughs> Obviously a person is responsible for the fire that goes out, right? Or, you know, financially, he's liable to, to guard it before there's any damage. And if there's any damage, he will res be responsible for the damages. But what does the verse say? Again, verse 5. Kitetse H, when the H goes out, when the fire goes out, Umatsakotsin. It says that it finds thorns. It doesn't say that it destroys the thorns. It finds the thorns. The Nechal Gadish or Kama. But what does it do? It consumes the, the corn or the grains. So then he's just now we're talking about a deeper level here. Whenever there is a plague, whenever there is a punishment that comes out into the world. The Gemara Baba Kama 60b says that evil, peronios, uh, punishments will come into the world on account of, because of the evil people's actions, because of them. But who is consumed first? The corn, the righteous. The righteous are consumed first. And that's based on this verse. Okay. Why am I saying? Because when we're talking about now that these people were so close to Hashem, how is it that they were taken? And we just saw that verse that talked about uh, Mikdashai. The, the Pusik itself in, in uh, 68, 36 I think it was? In uh, Psalms? 68, 36. Don't read it as from your sanctuary, but from your sanctified ones. God will become glorified through, and that means through, while they're alive and even when they're dead. Even however it has to happen, it will happen. Okay, so this is a very sad fact that we lost so many great rabbis, but, I'm not saying like, but, therefore it happened. I'm saying that these people were very righteous, 
I mean, I don't, I didn't know them personally, but I knew many people that did know. Many of these people were were very righteous. And um, there's another idea, while I'm on the subject, because I read it in the uh, Bnei Yehuda, uh, explained. I'm pretty sure it was him before Pesach. Before Pesach, which is even now, think about it, all that happened the month before Pesach. You had like 50 big Rabbanim that were killed. During, in order to be redeemed from Egypt, in order for us to be able to go out underneath the eyes of the Satan, so to speak. In other words, the Mekatreg. Mekatreg is the, one, the prosecutor. He's not, like in the book of Job, he's not going to let us go so easily, right? He's got a thumb on us, a finger on us, you know, uh, to... Prosecute and persecute. So when, God forbid, Jews die, righteous Jews are taken out of the world, it was so that the, to appease the prosecutor. Okay? So even when we were in Egypt, and the month before we left, the ninth plague, four-fifths of the Jewish people were taken out. Now, we don't say they were tzaddikim, but it doesn't matter. There's a spark in every Jew a spark in every human being, and by God taking them out, that was to lessen, to lessen, like L-E-S-S, -S, yeah, not as a lesson, L-E-S-O-N, but a lesson to lessen the, the mikatre, to lessen the persecution, the prosecutor, right? To give him no, no ability to say anything. So, Bezrat Hashem, we are all looking for the Mashiach, towards the, the coming of the Mashiach, and a, a Geula, Shalema, Bezrat Hashem, soon our days, and whatever we're experiencing now, we'll, have to, we'll be able to look back and say that it was all for the good. Right now, it's still difficult to say that, but we're obligated to say that. So we have to figure out how to say it. So that's, that's, a, that's a homework assignment for everyone. Okay, now we're in the middle of that we just read in Psalms chapter 50 verse 3 right the ones who are closest to the king the one who's closest to the king has to be more careful extremely careful uh, when it comes to the honor of the king ok let's go to um, continue the gam no chalamar. You're actually able to now say she'ain mukta umuchar lebatar. There actually is no. This is a, a, an interesting chiddush of the kliyakar. We all know in Gemara Pesachim that the Torah is not in order. Right? You need an oral Torah, by the way, in order to even know what was said first and what was said second. You don't go in chronological order of chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. I mean, you do, but that doesn't necessarily mean it happened in that order. So based on the Gemara and Pesachim, uh, chapter 6, uh, side B, that this Parsha, meaning our Parsha, chapter 16, in Leviticus, was said before chapter 10 in Leviticus. Hu asher diber Hashem bikrovai ekadesh. Mean, we just said, that God will be sanctified to those who are close to Him. I will be sanctified through those near to me. As Karov the Shmoa, then it makes sense. Shamar ze al ma shamar kadishboruchu nusach arba tevos elu. And now we understand when God said those words, in their coming close before me and they died. That was told first. Only later, meaning earlier, chapter 10, it's referred to as, I will be sanctified to those near to me. Okay. Let's go on. Well, Masha Parish Rashi, remember Rashi said there's two doctors, and one gave a little bit more, or maybe a lot more, uh, oomph to the, to the warning, right? He says, you don't want to die like, like so-and-so died. So perhaps what, what the intent is, since it already says, now you can find this in chapter 19, verse 24. Actually, it's 22 and 24, that it does mention about when Moses and Aaron and the Kohanim and the elders are going to go up to the mountain, there's different levels in who goes. But everyone else has to stay down below, meaning all the rest of the Kohanim have to stay down below. It's only Aaron 
and Moshe are going to go to the highest, even Moshe goes higher than Aaron, but Pen Yifrotz Behem, lest they all have to have their own borders, lest they break through. Breaking through is not a good thing, and wrecking destruction or havoc is basically a very general statement. It no, doesn't say you're going to die. Okay? Alkein Hutzrak Lazare Shenis. That's why there's this extra special warning. They shouldn't die in the way that our own sons died. Even over there, it's not clear that it's going to be death. But if you look at the whole verse from the words, Achremos, meaning our verse, until the Yemusim, they died, it's as if it was speaking to us. And we wouldn't know where Moses himself learned to, be, to teach over that, or even for himself to know that we don't want anybody to die in the way, same way that the children of Aaron died, because the reason Sharei lo hizkir kadosh baruch hu lemoshe shum davar memisos bnei Aaron, because it doesn't mention in those verses in Shmos nineteen verses twenty two and twenty four anything about death. Ulu devarenu hu miyushav. Now everything that we said now comes together. That Moses learned this from the fact that Hashem informed him of the reason of the death of the two sons of Aaron because they came too close and right away you have the command to Aaron which is going to inform right through the commands of what to do and what not to do we get an idea of what it was that they did wrong and all of the instructions that come afterwards is like a greater way of getting across the message. So this now all fits together. Now, some really amazing stuff coming up, and I hope you stick through with this because it's the most amazing thing. Daber el Aaron Achicha. It says, speak to Aaron, your brother. Speak to your brother Aaron. Why do we need to know that he's the brother of Moshe? Hello, we all know that. And it's every time it says, speak to Aaron, it doesn't say your brother. But here it does. So the clear car wants to know why is it here? What is it? Why is it fitting to mention? Why do we see that it's mentioned? Achava, achava, ach is brotherhood, or a brother. Achava is brotherhood. So to teach you that Aaron should not rely on the fact that he's Moshe's brother. Okay, Sha'al Yismoch Aaron al achava that he is, right, there's no protexia, there's no special protection for Aaron. Lomar shalo yamuz bevo al kodesh b'schuto shamosh That you're going to go in, it's a very um, precarious situation you're putting yourself in. Not every Kohen that went into the Holy of Holies came out alive. Especially during the Second Temple when the Sadducees were running the Temple, by the way, you should, in case you didn't know that. They, after the Hasmoneans had, Baruch Hashem, right, during the story of Hanukkah, but they stayed in power, and they shouldn't have stayed in power. That's a whole other story. But they basically, with the Greeks and the Hellenists, they became Hellenists themselves, and they bought the position. They made sure they were running the temple, while the Pharisees, who we are today, uh, they were running the Sanhedrin most of the time, and um, the ruling class in terms of halacha, in terms of religious life, like for the masses. But the Sadducees were running the temple. And it was very corrupt. Okay, why am I mentioning that? Just because we mentioned that Aaron should not think that he can get away with uh, just coming in any time because he's Moses' brother. What was it unique about? Moses had the ability to call upon and speak to God any time. Any time! Right? Even his wife explained that she was going to still be with him but not, um, not in the biblical sense because he is the kind of guy who can and needs to be purified at all times because he can talk to God at any time. Um, so anyway, I, I was mentioning that during the Second Temple, sorry, that unfortunately, fortunately, whatever the case may be, many, almost daily, almost week, oh, sorry, almost yearly, a new Kohen was installed right after Yom Kippur because the previous Kohen was not uh, fit for the job. He was only appointed uh, through corrupt, um, uh, through corruption, 
to become the Kohen Gadol. Um, so anyway, if a, if a Kohen Gadol lasted 40 years, or many years, then he was definitely deemed righteous. And as soon as he came out, every, any year, he was deemed righteous. So it was not an easy thing to do to go in to the Holy of Holies. But, let's talk about um, this point here. That Aaron should not think, should not think, that um, he's not going to die because he's his brother. Now what does it mean? Nechal Chetzi Basaro means that he is part of Moshe's own flesh. I want you to look at um, chat in Numbers 12.12 12, that you can find. Uh, chap- page 7, number 12. Let her, not like be, let her not be like the dead, which comes out of his mother's womb with half his flesh consumed. Now this is talking about um, Miriam, who was inflicted with leprosy. Okay, so we, Moshe prays for her. But in the meantime, what is she? She is really, she's a sister, right? A sister brother, basically the same idea here. Half of his flesh consumed it. God forbid... If, a, if a, a sibling dies, it's like half of your flesh is consumed. So that's relating to Aaron. Aaron's in the same position as Miriam, basically, in terms of being part of his own flesh. Meaning to say, even though he's your brother, n- nevertheless, don't rely on this. Meaning to say, Meacha shachicha hu after the fact that his brother, the Imyamus, that if the person dies, it's as if half of his flesh is consumed. That's even more reason to be careful. Okay? Because you're closer to Moshe, right? Anytime you have politicians, right? In the, let's say Biden's son, for example, right? Someone or Trump's son, anybody who's related to someone in politics. So they have to be extra careful not to get a special job that pays a lot of money for doing maybe, you know, I'm not saying nothing, but you get the idea. You cannot even put yourself in a position where there's a sniff of corruption, okay? So here, in, t- in terms of relying on the merit of Moshe to go into the Holy of Holies, because Moses himself was able to see God and speak to God at any times, right, without, uh, here, that's the next paragraph, some say, even though he's your brother in prophecy, meaning you're both prophets, but Moses' prophecy was much different than anybody else's. Um, it says by Matan Torah, which I, we already saw, chapter 19, verse 24 in Exodus, you, Moses, and Aaron are going to go up. It's true, they were both really high levels, the Avolak show, but what you might come to, Kishem Shemutula Moshe Likanes Bukholes, just like it was permissible to Moses to meet and God meet and speak to God at any time in the tent, the holy tent of meeting. Guess what? Moses was different. Because in, in uh, Numbers chapter twelve, verse seven, it says, The Kol Beiti Nemanu, out of all my house, he is the most trustworthy. We're talking about God speaking about Moses. And someone who, like a servant who's most trusted, can come in even, right? Who's going to else to give the, the master the towel in the bathroom, right? Who's going to be able to come in at any time? He doesn't have to knock. Everyone else has to make an appointment or knock. But the most trusted servant doesn't even have to knock, doesn't have to wait for anything, right? He'll come in and help uh, his master in the, the most uh, vulnerable of positions, let's say. Okay, so he can enter Bekol Ace she years any time he wants. Kach Yikanes Bahu Gamu. So too Moses was able. So Aaron might thought the same thing. No, Al Kain Ata Tzarichli Hazer Biyoter. Therefore Aaron needs to be extra careful. Okay, now this is get to really spooky stuff. When it said the Al Yavo Bekol Ace El Hakodesh, you cannot enter at any time you want. Remember that's what it says. You cannot come at all times. I want you to really let these words sink in your ears. Velo yavo, he shouldn't come. Bekol eis. How do you translate that? At all times into the holies. Lushen bekol eis. When you think of the words bekol eis. All times or any time. Ena meduktak. 
It's not clear. It's not yet specified yet. Let's go into it. What, is, what does it infer? The kol eis lo yavo, that you should never come, right? At any time you shouldn't come. That's not true. We know that he's supposed to come at certain periods of time. So, aval prachim yavo. But there are times, so not at just any time, but at designated times. Fine. But the clear car says that's not true. It's not any designated time. There's only one designated time. It's not just any specified time, it's only one specified time. And this is where the clear car says, That the reason for the ability to go into the Holy of Holies is all dependent on the sin of the people. He's carrying the sin of the people. Because the sin of the people is what separates them from their God. And because of their ruination, because of their sin, that also is what prevents the Kohen from going in. Because all of the guilt of the people is hanging on his shoulders. As it says, look in Exodus chapter 28, verse 1. It's verse 1. That's number 15 on the sheet. And you shall bring near to yourself your brother Aaron and his sons with him from among the children of Israel. Now that's what it says in Hebrew. To serve me as Kohanim, Aaron, Nada, Vihu, Eliezer, Yitam, Aaron's sons. But look in the Hebrew, it says, Mitoch b'nei Israel, Who? You? Atah karev alecha. You're going to bring near those with you. Who? Aaron, your brother. It's Benav, his sons, with him, Ito. Mitoch b'nei Israel, From within the Jewish people. They are representing the Jewish people. Teaching you what? That this ability to come close is only coming because they're representing the Jewish people. When Israel, when we are not meriting, so also the Kohen who's hanging on, who's carrying the sin. He does not merit to see the Shechina. That's why not every Kohen is going to come out alive. Not just because of his righteousness, but if, he, if let's say he was righteous and we weren't, he would be able to somehow atone. So it's a combination. Ki'im biyom kippurim. And when is the day that the Shechina would be seen? On Yom Kippur. Shekol Yisrael nimshula biyom ahu malach esharis. Because on that particular day, that's when the Jewish people are compared to what? Heavenly angels, administering angels. Shem lamala minazman. Angels are beyond time. There is no time. There's no space either, by the way. Okay? We saw this before earlier on in Genesis. Whenever it says lefanai, malachim are lefanai, when the angels are before me, it means they are angels and not regular agents. And they can be in more than one place at a time. They can be simultaneously as they went to... Uh, deliver a message to Esav and before they even went they came back with a response you have to hear that back in the day anyway so go on that angels are above time time has no control over them that's why this holy day called Yom Kippur is, is compared to there is no time. Time doesn't exist on Yom Kippur. Wait till you hear the next paragraph. But Kikol Yamos Hashanah Beklala Ace, all the days. When you think of a calendar, you think of time, right? You have your calendar in front of you. How do you tell time? Every 24 hours, it's a new box, right? You can tell time through the, the calendar. Guess what? Kikol Yamos Hashanah Beklala Ace, Hainuzman, Chutz Miyom Zeh. This day, Yom Kippur is not included in time. Now we said God created time, right? When Breshid Bralukim, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, he created time and he created mass. He created matter. 
But guess what? He also created evil. He created the Satan. And the Satan, Ha-Satan, has a gematria of 364. So the Satan has Shlita, has some abilities of, or his powers, can only exist 364 days of the year. This is the way God created it. The, last, the next to last paragraph is Leremez the Dover. As a hint to the matter, the word Hasatan is the gematria of 364. Shin Samech Dalet. V'yamosa Chama and the days of the year 365. Shin Samech. To teach you what? Shibakal Yamos Hashana that all the days of the year. Shahasatan that there's the ability for control, we're talking about um, or power to exist for the Satan or for the Yetzara. But by the way, it's the same thing. Okay? The Yetzara is the evil inclination that we all have, that God created within us, is the Malachamaves, is the angel of death, which is the Satan. Kulam Biklal Ha'es. All of them, all of that exists within time. But guess what? Chutz miyom zeh. There is no power on that day. Shame the satan mem shalabo. There is no power for the satan on that day. Al kein enum biklal ha'es. Therefore it's not included in time. Shokol yimos hashanah. Remember we're asking that it says you should go in there, right? You shouldn't go in there but kol eis. You shouldn't go in there at all times. He can only go in when there's no time, which is on Yom Kippur. Remez, Ramaz, Shelo Yevo Klal B'Shum Yom Shu B'Klal Eis. He should not enter, the Kohen should not enter when there is time. When the Sutton has any abilities. Ki Yom B'Yom She'ena B'Klal Eis. It's only this day. Ki Yom B'Yom She'ena, only on the day that has no time. Hu B'Yom Machila V'Slicha. And that day is the day of forgiveness and... Um, and um, another type of forgiveness, right? She Yisrael nimshul bol malachei ashares. This is the day that the Jewish people are compared to heavenly angels. Sheinam noiflim tachas ha'eh. That's the day that we don't fall in time. Vein bechla yemos hashan. It's not part of the rest of the year, because the word hasatan and who the satan is is mechate Moshe Bohem. He causes them to sin. That's what he's doing. He's provoking. He's the provocateur. Therefore, it's not appropriate for the agents. That's what a, a Kohen is an agent of the Jewish people. Well, we'll see that shortly. Are they angels, agents of God to us? Or they are agents to God? Usually it works out both ways. We'll see the Gemara in a second. It's not fitting that the shluchim, that the agents who are the kohenim of the Jewish people should go in to see the shechina except on that day. So let's go. Um, it's in Kedushin 23b. So my good friend Harvey Kazden, I mentioned him, uh, his name is Kohane Shluche de Rachmano Ninhu. In other words, his name is the acronym for the, Behold, the Kohanim are agents of God. That's what his name means. Okay? That's, he's a Kohen, and his name is the acronym Kajdan. <coughs> so the Gemara discusses this. We're not going to go into it now, but if you want to look at it, the Gemara comments, consider that Rav Huna, the son of Rav Yeshua, says with regard to the service in the temple, these priests are the agents of the Holy One which is the Hebrew that I just read, meaning they perform the temple services as the emissaries of God. And if it, as if it enters your mind that they are our agents, which is part of the argument the Gemara is having that we're not going into, is there anything that we cannot do but agents can do on our behalf? In other words, the idea that an agent represents the people, and we're not going to go into that any, anymore right now. Um... Where are we? Here we are. Now the very last paragraph. The Nosan Tam Ladavar. He wants to give a reason. Ki Anan Eira'e. Because he, God said, I'm going to appear in the cloud. Right? If you go back to page one. The very last 
part of the first verse. For I appear over the ark cover in a cloud. Meaning to say, Ilu Hayasham if it was there revealed the Shechina specifically, and then we're talking about the Shechina, it's revealed in the cloud. So the cloud is like opec, is that the word? It's, it's not clear. There's a cloud. So if it would have been without the cloud, just the Shechina, I couldn't, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't need to even prevent them because we already know that nobody can go in there and live. So that, I think the lesson would be learned by everybody, right? If there's a cloud there, then you can go in there and you get a, an imagination of what's going on there. But if the, there was no cloud, anybody that would go in there would, would surely die. As it says in um, chapter 33, verse 20. Um, okay. But now, the fact is that the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, is somehow clouded over in, in the cloud. Then he could see my honor. Then God's honor could be seen. It's the actual cloud that allows the ability to see. That's why it says, That I appeared in the cloud. Therefore, what I need to do, God needs to do, is to prevent them from coming in and just glancing any other time of the year that watch Yisrael misagalim bo averos. On those days, the other 364 days of the year, where the Jewish people are involved in sin, are weighed down with guilt. Okay, So there is the inability to actually see Hashem at any time, the kol ace, but only specifically on this day, right, we're talking about the Kohen Gadol, the Kohen, in, uh, in this case. So, Bezrat Hashem, let's, let's uh, sum this up a little bit, at least at the last part. That, it's, this is real stuff. This is like the real deal here, right? That there is a Satan who God created to give us the greatest gift. The greatest gift is the ability to choose. That's called free will. Free will is the is the where we earn right i think we ha we used to have this uh, saying in my group all deeds matter right god gave us the ability to correct our behavior to work on ourselves in order to give our us the greatest good as opposed to just receiving uh, bread of shame right bread of shame is worth nothing god wants us to earn he wants us to serve so he created the 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 friction within us for the ability to choose, and that is what the Sutton is all about. Okay, so hopefully, when we reach Yom Kippur, and we're looking forward to Yom Kippur, right? We're, we're, we don't wait to do tshuva, we have to do tshuva every single day, and we want to come close to Hashem as much as we possibly can. But we have to be very careful, right? This is what the idea here is that you have to do it fittingly. So, the main thing is to work on your character, no matter what sin they're accused of. And there's more than a list of what we mentioned. Whether it was strange fire, whether it was intoxication, whether they were poskening halach in front of the rabbi, whether they were just full of lave gas, some kind of haughtiness. These are the things we need to do to work on ourselves in order to come close to a God in a fitting way. Okay, so my prayer is during the Omer, especially now, and you know, you can take the whole Jewish calendar, especially now, especially now, at any time of year. This is the time to work on yourself, to elevate yourself uh, in your strength of, um, of character and in your amuna to Hashem and the way you deal with other people. So with that, I wish you all a Shabbat Shalom, welcome home to Torah, and um, have a nice life.